this uh, this uh, perfectly um, leads to our uh, next session and our first section, the rise of Bitcoin and crypto assets. The rise of crypto assets, uh, the rise of Bitcoin and crypto assets, um, which will. Um, opened by uh, Stephen Richardson from Fireblocks with his keynote on choosing a custody model, direct custody versus sub-custody. Great. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and, and hopefully uh, please correct me if uh, folks cannot see the screen, but hopefully uh, everyone can see the screen. So my name is Stephen Richardson. Uh, I'm the VP Head of Product uh, Strategy and Business Solutions uh, for Fireblocks uh, based out of Singapore. Um, it's a pleasure to join the CAC conference uh, this year. Um, I think from my perspective, what I'll spend the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is really exploring the models that we're seeing in the space today in terms of engagement with digital assets. Uh, and, and those models really resolve, revolve around two specific areas. The first is the idea of direct custody um, and, and utilizing uh, infrastructure to be able to, on your own, hold digital assets uh, and then really build products uh, on top of that. And the second being that of sub-custody, which, again, is, is a, a fully relevant model that we think makes a lot of sense uh, for, for certain players in the space and really to evaluate what are the different opportunities that arise with utilizing direct custody versus sub custody um, and even thinking through you know, future models in terms of opportunities where there might be opportunities for a hybrid based uh, approach to digital asset custody uh, for, for institutions. So, you know, we're going to look at a number of different headlines that have really come into the space uh, over the last few, over the last year or so. Um, and when you really look at those headlines, they really resolve around, you know, a number of institutions, both the large natively digital, like BNY Mellon, JP Morgan, DBS, uh, and those that are in the fintech space uh, and payment space like PayPal, uh, Revolut, Gemini, and Square, all really announcing uh, or you know, making a foray into the digital asset space or announcing given their existing products in the digital asset space, um, you know, the relevant growth that they're seeing uh, in terms of market adoption by retail. But I think one thing to really you know, make folks aware of is that there is a commonality in all of these different approaches and all of these different uh, providers that have made the announcement. I think the one big commonality is that all of them utilize some method of direct custody uh, or in self-custody. They, they, in essence, have built products uh, leveraging infrastructure that they've either, either brought in-house or bought to bring in-house or leveraging a hybrid model by which they're leveraging some custodial or sub-custodial infrastructure based off of regulatory uh, implications and geographies that they're operating against. And then for others, leveraging uh, self-custody as a basis of building uh, a set net set of new products to go to market. And I think that is really important to, to pay attention to because you know, this, this is a path that we're seeing uh, many large institutions take. Now, you know, when you think about the digital asset market, and and you know, most folks in this conference uh, conference are fully aware, uh, there are some significant differences in the way that digital asset markets operate compared to traditional, you know, fiat markets uh, or, or broader uh, securities. And, and the first is really that it is a 24-7 functioning global market, right? The, the idea is that the market moves you know, at all times. Uh, liquidity is moving through the system at all hours of the, all hours of the day and the night. Um, and it's a market that really has multiple venues that are operating uh, in a fully distributed and global way. I think the second thing is to really map out that distributed liquidity is that you have exchanges from Asia to Europe to the US that all have significant liquidity. You have global market makers um, from the likes of the flow traders of the world, the jumps, the Jane streets of the world, uh, to you know, smaller bespoke uh, market makers in different geographies, uh, like the Amber AIs here in Asia um, and, and the Enigmas in, in the UK that are all participating in, in a globally di distributed liquidity model, right? And so the idea of really having a centralized basis by which to participate in this marketplace 
place is something that is fundamentally different. I think the last thing, the third thing is that there are an ever evolving set of new use cases. So if you look at the space, you know, maybe four or five months ago, uh, you know, or probably six months ago, uh, we were seeing kind of the, the beginnings of DeFi, right? People were, were dabbling in the space. There was a lot going on in terms of potential interest. But we've actually seen an explosion uh, by both traditional firms, uh, you know, digital asset focused investment firms to really engage in, in, in new and unique products like DeFi uh, and what that means. And, and we anticipate that if you kind of look at the growth and the trajectory of this space, there'll be more ever evolving use cases that come into market that banks and institutions will need to evaluate as areas uh, to engage in. And then the last thing is the regulation, right? Um, you know, compared to you know markets that have been in place for for quite a bit of time, uh, the regulatory landscape for digital assets is constantly changing. You look at what happened in China recently in terms of digital assets. Uh, you look at what's happened in the United States with the OCC guidance along the lines of uh, banks being able to engage in digital assets. You're seeing what's happening in Germany with with uh, Baffin regulations. There is a constantly changing set of of, of regulatory clarity. Right. And, and it's going to take a period of time for that to solidify. And, and so really having flexible and adaptable infrastructure that allows you to respond to that in kind is something that we think is important. Now, when you look at the potential, you know, evolution of the digital asset offering for financial institutions, we're really seeing a, a number of different and unique products that are coming into the, into the market and, and areas of exploration for financial institutions. I think you start to see some things, and, and, and this has actually been quite an interesting take that we've seen in the market, is this idea of crypto rewards, right? This idea of crypto as a form of a rewards program to supplement existing you know, native products, whether they be credit cards or loyalty pro programs. And, and this actually has been an interesting one to look at because it's allowed fintechs, it's allowed banks, to really be able to dabble in the digital asset market without necessarily having to build the full-blown infrastructure to be able to support that. The second thing is custody, right? So we're seeing large banks and fintechs, again, take a look at custody of digital assets, both for retail, high net worth, and their other fintech customers that they're servicing, and building an infrastructure that enables kind of a growing and scalable service, uh, you know, at banking as a service uh, from, from a custody perspective. If you look at the third model, you're really seeing things around trading and brokerage. So you have the likes of Revolut, you have you know, a number of different institutions, Robinhood, Square, uh, a number of institutions looking at this trading and brokerage model. Um, you're seeing banks really start to engage in this trading and brokerage model. You have DBS here in Asia that's built an exchange. Uh, you're seeing you know, banks in Europe look at basically providing this to their customers, uh, both on the retail side uh, and direct to uh, B2B. And this becomes another interesting area that as you think about the combinations of different services becomes important in evaluating whether or not you choose a sub-custody or a direct custody model. And then you're looking at the last piece is really direct lending, right? So the ability to establish bilateral relationships, to rehypothecate digital assets that have been held on behalf of your customers, and to then provide customers things like crypto savings accounts and yield generating uh, basis. Again, another area of interesting uh, opportunity for folks from a product perspective, but requires a pretty flexible and adaptable infrastructure that generally is controlled uh, by the product owner. And then if you think about it, you have tokenization of CBDCs, payments, uh, slash receipts, and then staking in DeFi as other ancillary areas of exploration that we're seeing in the market in terms of uh, the broader engagement and adoption of digital assets. Now, when you kind of start to look at that at a real revenue opportunity basis, right? You know, you can look at these different opportunities and say there is opportunity once you build the custodial infrastructure to really engage and then generate ancillary revenue, um, you know, by having the ability to control your product and the product market fit, right? And, and what we've done is really give you some examples and, and a code of reference. So, I mean, if you look at someone like Coinbase at 223 billion in assets under, uh, under custody, look at someone like Gemini with $30 billion of assets under custody, it's not unreasonable for you know, a new institution to enter the space. And as they enter the space, uh, you, know, you know, have something between 500 million to a billion dollars 
worth of crypto assets under custody. And what we've done is really outlined the opportunity and the use cases that exist across these different modes and these different products. And as you can think about them, each of these different products, depending on your ability to create a unique market fit, to understand you know, the competitor, the competitive landscape, and then to build a unique product that services your customers, you know, has real revenue generating opportunity, right? And, and the idea really is that you now need to make sure you have the infrastructure that allows you to take advantage of those revenue generating opportunities. Now, when you think about traditional subcustody in the digital asset context, I think there's, you know, really some interesting things that become, you know, that are, are unique to what a subcustodian has to do in this space. Uh, the first is if you think about it in the traditional financial world, right? The sub provides the sub custodian provides custody services for the securities or other assets. Um, you know, given the infrastructure that has been built around those different securities and other assets, you know, the ability and the thought around control is somewhat limited, right? Because in essence. You, you know, if you have a security, uh, you move it out of the system, you generally still need to bring it back into the system uh, in order for it to be useful and have somewhat of some, some utility. Um, in general, they are outsourcing security of the asset and related operational components. You're seeing vendors like Checkpoint, Kaspersky, and others that are tightly integrated into the operational security uh, of the bank and the custodian as they provide these general services. What becomes really interesting as you think about the sub custodian in the context of digital asset market is that it, it's actually slightly different. It's it, well, not even slightly, it's significantly different. In the case of the sub custodian, you're looking at someone that's really securing the concept of the private key, right? They're required to hold uh, you know, those private keys. And then they're also required as a basis of holding those private keys to store and to transfer those digital assets on behalf of the customer, right? Really at the end of the day, like the security model uh, entirely changes with the basis of, of, of the digital asset space and leveraging a sub custodian. It makes sense, and again, we'll go into that for a number of different providers or for a number of different users, but in this case, this is something that we think is very interesting uh, to call out. Uh, generally, those keys are being held in, in, in cold storage and as a basis of one being able to acquire insurance, um, given limited capacity of insurance in, in you know, hot and warm markets, but generally they're being held in cold storage, which affects the time to basically deployment of the asset when you think about the movement of the asset on chain. Now, unlike the traditional subcustody model, like the safekeeping of private assets of, of, of private keys really does introduce a lot of new complexities into this outsourcing model. Right. Uh, generally speaking, there is a you know a lack of operational flexibility when leveraging a sub custodian, as they are the guardians of that private key. Um, you know, really, they are being diligent, and and sub custodians are being diligent in how they approach the security of that private key. But that diligence may not necessarily reflect the priorities or the business needs of the organization that is leveraging uh, the sub custodian. I think the second thing is for a lot of the sub custodians that we see today and a lot of the institutions that we're working with, the balance, there's a balance sheet imbalance. Um, in essence, a lot of the customers, you know, the large banks, the fintechs actually have a much larger balance sheet than some of the sub custodians we're seeing in the today's space, which really begs the question as to whether or not leveraging of your own balance sheet and then acquiring the right technology apparatus to execute direct custody makes more sense for these players. And then the last thing is a jurisdictional risk, right? So most of the subcustodians store their private keys in their home jurisdictions, thus exposing the financial institutions to geopolitical and regulatory risk. Now, obviously, in places like Germany, it has become very apparent that, you know, as you're utilizing a custodian, the keys need to be held, uh, you know, in the jurisdiction in Germany, for example. But in a lot of other countries and a lot of other jurisdictions that we're seeing, there is no such requirement, which actually leaves people exposed and, and vulnerable uh, to any implications or any changes in the regulatory nature of the sub custodian. Now, when we think about the benefits of direct custody, I think there's you know, five really key ones that, that we have noticed and seen customers take. If you look at someone like PayPal, they were leveraging a sub-custodian. They out acquired you know, Curve as a digital asset infrastructure to be able to launch products. 
You look at someone like Revolut, again, I'd leverage a subcustodian and then brought a lot of the technology in-house to be able to do that and execute on their own. Uh, DBS as an example, utilizing, I believe, Metaco as a basis of being able to drive their own digital asset custody. There is a, a significant you know, uh, benefit to the idea of direct custody. Um, I think when you think about that, there's you know, the core and most important is the ability to maintain the full asset control and offer a top tier user experience, right? If you look at PayPal, you know, indicating that 50% of its users uh, that engage in Bitcoin look at the app every day. The ability to think about what that means in terms of user experience, in terms of not only a retail product, but as you're serving on a B2B basis to be able to provide a comprehensive tool uh, for providers to be able to use is really interesting. The idea that you can open, withdraw, and deposit windows and be able to move assets 24-7, you'll be able to access liquidity globally, and then look at new models like DeFi is something that we think is a, is a pretty interesting place to look. The second is you control your own risk and compliance, right? A lot of the times when you engage with digital assets, there's a real question by the compliance department of what does compliance in this space look like? How do we create our own customer risk profiles? How do we drive automation in this process? And we think that by leveraging direct custody and building infrastructure or leveraging you know, infrastructure like Fireblocks and others, there's an ability to really control this, own, this, this risk appetite and to be able to build the level of bespoke integrations to services like Chainalysis and Elliptic that allow you to do and drive automation in the compliance department. The third thing is to really escape the closed loop, right? The idea that basically connectivity for liquidity trading and lending venues are need to be kind of entrapped within the self-custodial environment or ecosystem is something that we think is, is really interesting. Um, the ability to really see, right, and access you know, the liquidity globally, I think it's been a benefit for many of the firms that we've worked with here at Firebox. And the idea that you can kind of open that ecosystem up and move from a closed loop model to more of an open model uh, in terms of how you engage with digital assets and counterparties in the ecosystem, I think is something that is quite valuable for a number of folks to think about. And then I think something that gets overlooked quite a bit is the idea of future-proofing your business. As we mentioned earlier, we anticipate there are going to be new models that come about because of the evolution and, 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 and the continuing um, development in the blockchain space. And so when you think about you know, the idea of having uh, a direct custody model where you're actually able to respond by you know, leveraging you know, best-in-class vendors, uh, either you know partnering with those vendors to build solutions yourself. The idea is that you're able to util utilize future-proof technologies like MPC, uh, SGX, and you know the idea of you know bespoke policy engines as a basis of really future-proofing that business and working with technology providers that are going to be looking out on the leading edge and anticipating where the changes in the markets will be, and then enabling you that to bring that back in-house. And the last thing I think is, is important is being able to leverage your own balance sheet, right? The idea that you can avoid some of the counterparty and geopolitical risks that are associated with subcustody, and that you'll be able to provide trust and safety to your customers as you're able to articulate, right, the backstop of the engagement with digital assets is really coming from the bank itself or from the fintech itself. Now, this is just a quick overview of, of kind of where we see the direct custody for subcustody play and, and kind of some of the benefits that we think um, and things to be you know, keenly aware of as you engage you know, in this market. Now, we do think that subcustody, right, and the idea of hybrid subcustody in a lot of sense, in a lot of places makes a lot of sense, right? We're, we're not anti subcustody. We think there are opportunities where it makes sense for certain players. And we think for you know, fintechs, banks, and, and others, it makes sense to really explore the idea of self-custody. Um, I think as you think about you know, these different areas and, and criteria to evaluate on from balance sheet generally of, of the subcustodian uh, against the self-custody basis, uh, if you think about the flexibility that's required in terms of the integrations into third parties, uh, the integrations into different market venues, um, the idea to kind of expand beyond the subcustodial ecosystem, uh, that becomes very interesting. If you think about integrations and utilizations around things such as tokenization and compliance and automation, that also becomes important. And as you think about trading strategies and engagement with regulators, uh, that becomes important to look at in terms of the subcustody model. So, you know, generally we found that subcustody works well for you know, long only funds, family offices, and asset managers. But as you look to build products and services on top of custody, uh, we find the self-custody model works well. 
So thank you for your time today and, and appreciate um, you know, the opportunity to speak with you today.